Faith, Jan. Okay, we are live now. Hello, hello everybody. I won't say good afternoon because people are following this uh, keynote lecture from all around the world. It depends on the time zone where you are. We are uh, extremely pleased and honored to have with us uh, Professor Yanir Bayam. Yanir uh, is a physicist by training. He holds a Bachelor of Science and PhD in Physics at, from, from MIT. And uh, he has since uh, late 80s contributed to advancing the field of complex system sciences, introducing mathematical rigor, real world applications and educational programs for concepts and insights of this field. He is the founding fa uh, president of the New England Complex Systems Institute and the founder of ncoronavirus.org, check it out, a global network of over 4,000 volunteers formed in February this year to provide information, guidelines, and policy advocacy to fight the COVID pandemic. His recent work quantitatively analyzes the origins and impacts of market crashes, social unrest, ethnic violence, military conflicts, and pandemics, the structure and dynamics of social networks, as well as the basis of creativity, panic, evolution, and altruism. He has advised the US government on global social unrest and crisis in Egypt and Syria, counter terrorism strategy, military force transformation, market regulation, delivery of disease prevention services, and control of hospital infections. He regularly advises NGOs and corporations regarding their use of complex systems science. He has authored more than 200 journal articles, and his work on causes of the global food crisis has, was cited among the top 10 scientific discoveries in the 2011 by uh, Wired magazine. Also, his scientific visualizations are well known, and he has been recognized as the best of by Wired magazine in 2011 and 2013, and from Modabo in 2013. Now, the title of Professor, uh, Professor Bayam's uh, today's uh, keynote lecture is Complexity, Modeling, and Risk Management for COVID. And I was thinking a little bit about this title just to start uh, talking about it. Someone, uh, Yanni, once said that in that famous soliloquy from Shakespeare's Macbeth, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Actually, the most important word is that end. So it popped into my mind that among all the words, all the words in the lecture's title, complexity, modeling, risk management, and COVID, perhaps, perhaps the most important word is still that end between modeling and risk management. Because it is a peculiar end, connecting but both separating, because it could also have been an or, modeling or risk management, or even versus, modeling versus risk management. My point here is that among many things this COVID experience has been for all of us, one thing it has also been is learning. And we have learned that for decision making, for assuming behaviors, for public policy, the appeal to, na to a naive idea of science isn't perhaps enough. If, according to this naive idea, the science is a set of protocols based on empirical data to establish the degree of confidence, confidence with which we can say that something is true, the point of risk management, and in particular of risk management under deep uncertainty, we've been, say, since January, and even now we are. The point of that risk management is what to do and what actions and precautions to take when one does not know, when one is ignorant. The key difference between the two then is something that I believe Professor Bayam is among the best in position to talk us about. This event is co-moderated by Giovanni Fusco, a colleague from the SNRS from France and the University of, uh, of uh, Université de Côte d'Azur. And the key lecture is streamed live on YouTube. So we invite all our viewers to ask their question in the chat there. And after the lecture, 
we will direct a collection of questions to Professor Bagnam to engage him in a discussion. It's going to be about 20, 30 minutes of talk by uh, Professor Bayam, and then a little bit of discussion for whatever time remains within this, uh, this pleasant hour uh, of opening ICSA conference. Having said that, Professor Bayam, the floor is yours. Thank you. Very, uh, very, very well articulated uh, statements. Thank you. And very carefully thought. Um, so, I, I want to start with the core of our challenge, which is we're faced with a very big uh, danger, even potential danger, if not danger, but of course now we know it's very big danger. Um, how do we respond when policymakers turn to science? for um, help. What is the um, function and role that uh, is required? And, and here we have um, a, a really basic, um, uh, let's call it um, manifest uh, incompatibility which has arisen in the outbreak response, which is that many people who are experts in, in this context, epidemiology, are their frame of effort is guided by academic contribution. And academic has many meanings, uh, but one of them is not relevant to the real world. And the point of that understanding is that academics are not usually responsible for making life and death decisions. If you wanted to find someone who was regularly making life and death decisions, maybe you would go to someone in the military where their decisions, whether they make them right or wrong, are going to be affecting lives of their people. But academics are not usually in that situation. And what they do in order to make a contribution is they are involved in a process of exploration. They identify hypotheses, assumptions, they derive conclusions, perform experiments, and, and all of that is designed to, over time, over a long time, to improve our understanding of the possible things that might happen and not necessarily the specific condition that is present in a particular circumstance. And, and that difference is, is absolutely critical. And we've seen really the failure of the academic approach in addressing real world conditions during the context of this outbreak. Because what do we have to do? If we're saying at the beginning of a paper, let's make this assumption, and at the end of a paper, we say, here is the conclusion. The policymaker will not understand the fact that the assumption was not validated, that the assumption is not known to be true about the current circumstances. That's very bad because if the assumption was wrong, then the conclusions surely are not um, uh, known to be the right ones. Uh, for this context. And among the really big assumptions that have been made in the context of this outbreak are not assumptions about disease and disease transmission, which one might argue is the domain of expertise, I think is reasonable to argue is the domain of expertise of many of the advisors in this context. But the assumptions are assumptions about human behavior societal response about the decision making of the policymakers themselves. Many of the papers are saying, we don't know that policymakers will be able to make this decision. So let's make that as an assumption that they won't and see what the conclusions are. Once they arrive at their conclusions, there is a feedback loop between the conclusions and the policymakers decisions often self-fulfilling prophecies, which have been unfortunate 
in not taking the actions that are needed in order to stop the outbreak. So, so where do we get off of this uh, challenge? Well, there turns out that there is a mathematical statement, and I'm, I'm saying this because many people here are technical, and one should understand where is the math that is going wrong. And the math that is going wrong is in the assumptions of statistics, the fact that prior experience is a good indicator of future outcomes, right? Because we have this on set of cases that have a normal distribution, and so the normal distribution the deviations from the average are small, and so we know what's going to happen in the future because we have the sample of what's happened in the past. That statistical assumption is not a good assumption about an outbreak, which has exponential behavior and tails of impacts that we have not experienced. The second is this exponential behavior is exactly the condition of what is known mathematically as chaos. Chaos is the sensitivity to initial conditions. Any assumption that you make, whether it's about the dynamics directly or the conditions, the parameters, has exponential sensitivity in the context of a pandemic, exponential behavior. And so if we make the assumptions, whatever the assumptions are, and we're wrong by a small amount, we have the difference between an exponential growth an exponential decline. We have the difference between in factors of multiples of numbers of cases over time, and we're simply talking uh, in orders of magnitude incorrect results. So that's the mathematics, but the, it turns out that the solution of the problem in this context turns out to be very straightforward. And that is to understand that really there are only two things that matter if we have exponential growth or we have exponential decline, right? The, the two conditions that we have to differentiate. And also, we have three pieces of information. One is that the disease is a terrible disease. And there's been so much effort to try to diminish the, 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 the terribleness of this disease. But anybody who has been involved in outbreaks, the physicians, the, the real world conditions of outbreaks knows that this is a horrendous disease. The second thing is that it's super fast. So again, people have made all kinds of estimates, but roughly tenfold per week is the multiplier in terms of growth. And the third thing, which we've learned by direct experience, as well as the principles of understanding transmission, is that we can stop the outbreak. And once we understand that we can stop the outbreak, then the answer is very clear. You want to stop it as fast as possible, as soon as possible. That reduces the health impacts. It reduces the suffering. It reduces the deaths. And the thing that many people have argued about, which makes no sense, it reduces the economic impacts as well. There is no other strategy that makes sense in the context of a terrible disease that grows rapidly and can be stopped. So once one understands that, and this is what's been happening since January in my work, I can do all kinds of scientific analyses. I can do all kinds of subtle discussions of chaotic behavior and tales of distributions and, and understand more details about the transmission processes and so on. And there's some of that is useful, like knowing that CT scans are a better test than PCR tests. There are details that matter. But ultimately, there's really only one question, which is, if we want to do the right thing, then we have to go all out, stop the disease, eliminate it, drive it to extinction, go back to normal, there is no second wave. There's no circulating in the population. Dinosaurs don't come back every fall. The reason they don't is that they're extinct. And the same thing can be true of the coronavirus. So I would like to finish my remarks and open for questions by inviting everyone to participate in this effort for clarity of explanation, clarity of understanding of what needs to be done, and direct engagement because 
eventually every one of us is playing a role in this outbreak. And the point of an exponential outbreak is that it is sensitive, right? That's the sensitivity to initial conditions. So everything that anybody does can have a major role in what's going on. And they can have that major role locally in their community by organizing a community effort to eradicate the disease. And because the transmission is community-based, there's a village in Italy that said, we're going to get rid of this, and they got rid of this, and it's not there anymore. I can give you the name. You can look it up in the press. Um, it only takes a local community, even a city block, to work together in order to eradicate the disease in their space, and then to influence others to do the same. So where the government is not doing the right thing, which it's not doing in many places in the world, and largely because of confusion, there are some places where in, maybe there are intentional acts and those should be uh, addressed uh, very severely. But where there is um, confusion, um, we can act locally. We can build the efforts up where we have influence to reduce the confusion. We can reduce the confusion and find ways to, to affect larger scale efforts. But every one of us has the ability to, to play a role. And I invite you, uh, three months ago or so, I don't even remember, um, uh, when it was clear that the outbreak was going to be, quote, allowed, really allowed to go to the West from China, it could have been stopped. When it was allowed to go to the West, I simply sent out a call for volunteers because stopping this outbreak is beyond any individual person's ability. And we've had thousands of people volunteer through the end coronavirus uh, system. The endcoronavirus.org is the website. Um, and everyone, absolutely everyone, is invited to participate in whatever way you can, whether it's by in a technical way, whether it's in a um, com in through communications, community organizing. We are now extensively organizing many communities around the world to take responsibility because we see that the devolution of authority is to the community level in many places. Uh, and where it's not, in much of Europe, there has been national actions taken. We still have the challenge of getting to zero in many places. And the action to get to zero, again, requires clarity. If we do the right thing, if we take strong action, we get to zero, we can return to normal, drive it to extinction. It doesn't take very long especially in much of Europe. Now, in Italy, there has been a very long-term lockdown. And part of the reason is that there were several steps that were not implemented uh, in Italy that could be helpful. Uh, but the main challenge right now is to make sure that people understand that the difference between zero and any other number is that zero times anything is still zero. And if we can communicate that fact, then the world will be a better place because we will get to zero. What do we need to do it? Let me just review where there is an outbreak. So we need, first of all, to have geographic boundaries. Opening up travel where we don't have zero cases is an invitation to more outbreaks. We need to separate areas. Much of many of the countries in Europe are at zero already. We need to implement some amount of travel restrictions so that the green areas remain green and we can focus our attention on getting rid of it where the outbreaks are. And then where the outbreaks are, we need to do all of the strong actions, whether it's um, stay at home, whether it's masks, whether it's um, um, safe services, uh, whatever are the things that are the most uh, uh, relevant. If we have a very localized outbreak, then the focus, and this is in general true also, is on who has the disease. Identifying through testing, using contact tracing to identify close contacts, um, isolating those who are sick, quarantining those who are close contacts, using better testing. CT scans have been much more powerful than uh, the PCR tests, and this has been done in, uh, not only in China, but in Belgium, in France, in Spain, uh, in order to be
Pianir, I lost your, your sound for some reason. I can't hear you any longer. How is it now? Yeah, it's good now. Okay. okay. So if you do, so that's the second set of things. And the, so we have the, we have the, sorry, it's the third. So we have the travel restrictions for green zone strategy, build up green zones until they occupy the whole space, whether it's a block in a city or whether it's an area of a country, we can get to zero in some places, go back to normal and then expand. Second, we have the test, we have the social distancing, um, and then we have the test, trace, isolate. And those are the three pillars. Uh, the last one I would add, of course, is where there's an outbreak, protecting vulnerable people, protecting vulnerable institutions, high-risk institutions. We've learned the hard way and unfortunate that we had to always learn things the hard way, that we have to take strong actions in order to protect them. And that's it. That's all. And I'm happy to take questions. Sure. Great. Thank you, Anil. Thank you for this intensive and, and, and also uh, interesting uh, set of uh, observations and comments. And it is uh, uh, actually uh, a very, very, the, the real honor to have you here is not that because of your, all, only because of your scientific work, but because of your engagement and direct involvement in these things. So it is really important. We all, all of us who follow you on Twitter are, are, are keenly wait, waiting for daily global updates of, on, on the outbreaks. So I want to ask you a couple of questions, then also dropping something from the uh, online chat. First, uh, about the technical, uh, one technical issue, maybe you can, uh, you've put out uh, a paper recently, a couple of days ago, with Nassim Taleb and, and, and Cirillo, about this distinction between point prediction and the, the distribution properties. I think it is a relevant point related to what you were saying before about statistical assumptions Correct. that are embedded in the discussion and the idea that it seems to be uh, 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 embedded into that paper is that from the past data, even if you're not able to predict, the, uh, say, uh, make a point prediction or even modeling it, making a point prediction on the numbers, um, contagions, number of deaths, you can, you're able to say that the, this distribution of the pandemics are so fat tailed that uh, uh, even single one can have a catastrophic outcome. So that means that, I mean, you shouldn't be playing, basically, maybe we can put it this way, you shouldn't be playing Russian roulette. And even if you play Russian roulette and you don't get the bullet in your head, you still make the wrong decision by accepting to play the Russian roulette. You, you see what I mean? We are yeah. risking people say, okay, nothing can we see at, at the end, we had just a, 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 a small number, but again, you were playing the Russian roulette. So in January, this was kind of the decision. You don't play the Russian roulette, whatever is the number of the bullets with impotent. Yeah. So this distinction. The second thing that I could ask you, because also connecting it to a question from the from the let me let me add to that for a moment. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Because even today, where many people are diminishing the risks, the statement that we actually may have much higher risk than we are aware of is still not being made. And this applies to the fact that there are people who are sick or have been sick, and we don't know the consequences yet. And we don't know if we allow it. So the consequences may be quite severe. These people, there's been uh, um, people who have been declared to be well, have walked out of hospital and have died, just dropped dead. And, and there are people who have long-term effects damage to lungs. We don't know how that progresses. There are viruses that continue to live in the body and continue to cause harm, even death, years later. We don't know those costs yet. And instead, what's happening is that there are many people who are saying, oh, this is just like the flu. And, and, and the point is that they're doing everything possible to shut their eyes to the harm that is already present in order to convince themselves that it's less, whereas there continues to be a risk that it will be much more. And if you were to gamble on a zoonotic disease, will it be less severe or more severe than you know already? Right, the tail risk 
is the fact that the likelihood that you will have a much more severe consequence is actually more significant than we understand. And, and that's still not appreciated. And as another example, the early outbreaks where there was a lot of science done only lasted a few weeks. Sure, sure. The later outbreaks that have been, you know, in Europe and in the U.S. now are much longer. At this point, it may be possible that the disease will enter into the food supply and we will have other kinds of dangers from this disease that were not possible at the beginning because the outbreaks were so short. So we have systemic risk as well as individual risk that we haven't really yet evaluated. And why would we want to gamble Russian roulette with the ongoing hidden risks that we haven't yet even evaluated? So there is still this issue sure, sure. of the long-term risks that we don't understand. Good. Yeah, sure, sure. Now, uh, one question uh, I will connect it also to, the, to something that has been uh, said uh, asked in the chat a little bit of that question. Rather than I try to switch down some uh, situations. Because right now in Europe, for instance, when the contagion seems to be winding, uh, uh, winding uh, again, this, uh, positions resurface that is perhaps already over, that we've done it, but the borders were just opened the, the other day. I, I don't know if you get the notice, there was this protocol of which countries, and they are greenish, but they are not zero places. Right. So again, how, what kind of complexity that adds to you? And then connecting into the US situation, I, 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 I we read your your these reflections on kind of a duality of situations, but uh, someone asked, what would you call, what would you consider a poster boy state? Uh, someone suggests, is it a Vermont or is it just a case uh, that they are doing, doing well? How much was that, was that just luck or good policy? It's good uh, uh, okay, so a little bit of what happens around the world and how you see the situation then. Another thing we have to observe is that uh, the, the, the South America is basically bleeding. Yeah. Uh, they are in the they are winter period, so uh, at least in the, in the southern part, so maybe it is also seasonal phenomenon, but again... No, it's, it, the seasonal has been surely shown not to be correct because we have in hot climates and cold climates, now people are trying to say, well, if you're indoors and not outdoors and so on, yes, there are variations, but when you have such a rapid growth, much of that becomes details. Again, details can be important, but they're not the main problem. The main problem is that the disease itself transmits very fast and is very severe. So the, let's go back to your question about people saying, oh, it's already over, we only have a few cases. That's how we started this game. Unfortunately, game, as far as some people are playing it. In the beginning, there were only a few cases, only a few, 10 cases, no problem, Five, 50 cases, no problem, we're okay. We don't see a big effect, so it's not that serious. Then, then 500, and then 5,000, and then 50,000, zoom, right? That's the exponential growth, which the exponential growth looks tiny until it is overwhelming. And now we've had exponential decline. So now we're down near again. We have five cases, we have 10 cases, we have 50 cases, no problem. Right. This 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 is a scale blindness. Right. Where we say if we have a small amount, we don't see it. And that's appropriate if you have a statistical behavior. It's not appropriate if you have exponential growth. So right now we're again and, and we, I just put out a piece. It's on Twitter today. Which talks about exactly this problem, the psychology of getting to zero. And this challenge is, as the number of cases goes down, we work so hard. We're down at, you know, we're now down at one per million case, right? And everyone says, hey, there's one in a million risk that I will be sick today. So I don't really need to be careful, right? And then, of course, a few more cases happen. 
and then a few more, and then a few more, and again, at some point, we will have thousands and tens of thousands and so on cases, and we'll have to take strong action. How much pain do we want to experience before we learn that you have to actually get it to zero in order to stop it? And this is the patience part. We have to be patient at the end. And Italy has been incredibly patient compared to the US in the lockdown, in, in a long lockdown, and surely other parts of the world have taken very strong actions to get to zero. But then it gets down far enough and all of a sudden, hey, we don't have cases in the hospital. You know, there are very few cases, so most of them are mild. And so there may be none or one or two severe cases. It looks like no problem. And then boom. Okay. Sure. Sure. So what else do we need to do? What else do we need to do is to make sure that we have in place the things that will stop a few cases. Strong contact tracing, strong tra and geographical separation. Because the geographical separation means that instead of having one per million in the country, let's say a country of 50 million, you have 50 cases. But if those cases are localized in one area and we provide that information, then it's not 50 in 50 million, it's 50 in 50,000. <clears> so we have to localize it. So that's really important. And, and you asked about the, the situation in the US. People don't have patience. They do a little bit and they said, hey, we've done that already. And, and people just, there, there's this very big gap between understanding action and consequences, right? If you say, hey, we did the, 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 in the US for some reason, there was this mistaken understanding that if you do a lockdown, right, if you do a stay at home order, that that's everything that you need to do. So if you do the stay at home order and it didn't work, well, what else are you going to do? You can go back to the stay at home order, but we've done that already. And if it didn't work, why should we do it again? So there's this big resistance to going back to doing something that didn't actually stop the problem. But the reality of the situation is that it's not about just the stay at home order. I said what the three things are, the green zone travel restrictions, the social distancing, which is basically some one part of, you know, the, the travel, the stay at home order is one part of, and the um, uh, testing, tracing, isolating, and so on. And if you look at the set of things in the US, very rarely did people isolate away from home. There's only a few places, including New York, where they had a really significant program to do that. Um, there is um, and the testing was not a very good testing in the US um, the, because they didn't use CAT scans and um, uh, isolation. Uh, so because isolation was not very well done, it's very hard to stop it. People didn't use masks uh, and masks is a super powerful uh, way to reduce the transmission and so on. So you, you, if you pick and choose and you kind of do things in a half way, well, you're going to end up with a steady amount of cases. And then you say, okay, we've done this. Now let's open up and boom, you end up with more cases. But even in the areas where the number of cases has declined dramatically, like New York and much of the Northeast, the clear understanding that you have to get to zero is not present. The statement is, hey, we're down low, so it's not so bad. So we're going to open up seems to be the way people are thinking. And mm -hmm. we've got to change that if we're going to get rid of this. Sure. Okay. Just a couple of more questions and maybe a little comment, a more general comment so to, to wrap it up. Uh, I will pick up from, 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 from the internet uh, a set of questions uh, about just randomly try to reorder it as they come, as I see them. Uh, something about uh, efficiency and the most effective way to do contact tracing, what are the strategies there? Then another question which is related to this. Uh, uh, Don't give me multiple questions. Let me do one at a time. Okay, okay, go ahead, go ahead. About something about social uh, contact tracing. Okay. Okay. So um, 
There are two different domains of contact tracing. It's very important to understand contact tracing when you have strong action, including stay-at-home orders. And in that context, contact tracing is basically the people that you live with, housemates, family members, and the small social network. Of course, it may include workplace. If there are essential services and one of the people becomes sick, then that requires uh, action. The other case is much more difficult, is when you don't have uh, uh, um, uh, restrictions, then you have to do much more careful evaluation of who might be contact. Um, in either case, <coughs> strong action in terms of identifying who is sick uh, is really important. And that's why good testing is, is helpful. And the, the, the strategy that was very successful in Lithuania and in um, uh, Argentina, in the areas where they used it, uh, is to test everyone, symptomatic or asymptomatic. And um, in that context, the high-risk individuals, the local contacts, up to 100 people, say, about, should be tested, PCR testing, CT testing, in order to identify cases who was sick. Also use serological tests to identify where the transmission came from. Because the people who are sick, who transmitted the disease, may no longer be sick. But using serological tests, you can identify them. So by identifying the transmission process, you get clarity about what's going on. Again, this community, the computer science information community, should understand that in an outbreak, information is everything. If you knew everybody that was sick, everyone that had the disease, you would be able to stop it within two weeks because you would just quarantine those people. So the key thing is to understand where the disease is, geographically localized, where the outbreak is. What is the network of the transmission? And yes, there is you know electronic ways of doing this and they may be helpful, but before you get to the electronic ways of doing this, you have to have the basic infrastructure in place for understanding what is going on and to setting up isolation so that people are not ineffectively isolation. Because no matter what you do, if people don't isolate themselves successfully, you're not going to get rid of the disease. Sure. Now, since you're talking about this local testing and lot of local action, just one question before asking you then the final question myself is someone is suggesting this question, the, 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 the issue of what kind of scale we could think of working with when we are talking about setting borders limitation could we think many of the people in this conference are, are doing information science is applied to urban planning they and we all work at very sometimes urban suburban neighborhood levels yes could we think as we have this state level and national levels uh, restrictions could we think that are more we could find an efficient and effective way to work on a smaller scale so that we have closed neighborhoods, open neighborhoods, and some kind of strategy. Of course, it takes a lot of coordination, data management, and problems. So I can understand why generalized lockdown measures are, in principle, easier to implement. But do you see any cases? Maybe there were some interesting examples that you were mentioning in Twitter in Brazil. Yes of yeah. communities that were able yeah, to, mostly, but yes, yeah. to enforce their, their kind of a true kind of a community organizing this this protective uh, behaviors and attitudes that yeah oh yeah in brazil also yes and the answer is yes and and the, the statement is that we have to think about it in a multi-scale way right the multi-scale way is if you have a large green zone then that's great you don't have to have small zones inside it the more you have disease, the more you want to create much more localized intervention. And the smallest unit we could talk about is, you know, there's the individual as a unit. There's the home as the unit. But the natural unit is actually the urban unit, which is the city block. Because by setting up a city block as a safe space, it can grow in a natural way. Whereas the family unit is not big enough. So you have to have the smallest social unit of the city 
a city block as the essential unit. Now, of course, the city block should be in part of a community where you can expand the area that's clear of the disease. Um, okay, so, no, no, me, sorry. Um, so the point is that if we set this up in a way, we can start from city blocks and expand to urban areas. And we can also start from countryside and take towns, villages, and create green zones there and expand them. And ideally, over time, what we have is we have larger and larger green areas that we don't have to have the internal boundaries of. That's how it works. But we end up with you know, expanding it to the world. This strategy is much faster. Imagine that you have to take a country. You can think about it just in terms of the world, since it's multi-scale. Sure, sure. We have to wait for all of the world to be free of the disease before we uh, open up anywhere. Then obviously that's going to take a long time. So the same thing is true about a country. If we have a country and we have to wait for all of the country to be free of the disease, it must take a much longer time. The same thing is true of a city. If we have to wait until all of the city is free of the disease, it will take a much longer time. So the basic idea is to use the smallest unit possible. If there is a neighborhood association, a, a, a strong relationship among individuals in a local community, and they can say, look, we're done with this. Maybe the government doesn't know what it's doing, but what we want to do is we want to get, so we're, what we want to do is to become free of the disease. And this is what we are setting up in areas in the US and in other parts of the world where the government is not taking the right kind of action. We're setting up grassroots community efforts and anybody who wants to join those community efforts that we're establishing, and there are really many, many places, please let me know and you can, you can uh, send me messages. You want to give them my email? You can give them my email. I will. Um, uh, let me, I can post it. How, I don't know if I can post it into the... Uh... Post it after the conference, we will distribute it to all the participants and also yeah. for, our, for our, all our online infrastructure. And anyone who wants to organize, anybody who wants to work with us on the data aspect of it, we're, we're building data infrastructure. If you go to our website, we have county level maps of the US we have neighborhood level maps, you know, zip code level maps of, of Tucson, Arizona. We are building house level maps in South Carolina. All of the details of data infrastructure is important in order to understand how to act on this outbreak. Okay, I just want to ask you, uh, since you mentioned uh, what you were saying now at, at the end of your, of your answer, I think will bring us home to one last issue that I think is relevant. It is relevant both for the effectiveness of dealing with the outbreak and containing it, but it is also relevant in more general terms, uh, which is related to, let's say, moral and political side of what we learn about ourselves and our communities in this case. There is something relevant about the social fabric and cohesion, both in dealing with the outbreak, but also well, at a certain point, you, you put out a touching post on Twitter. Uh, it was at a certain moment, maybe it's even related to your personal losses that you have in this, in this thing. And it, was, it is, I think, relevant what you've learned about how we treat our most fragile uh, members of communities. And the uh, argument that someone was saying, well, basically, it is the utility of people. So if, you're old, you're basically useless, I mean, who cares? And I think it is a relevant point, again, both in terms of the effectiveness, because what you are saying on different scales, it is a question of a collective action. It is a problem of collective action and it is an issue of collective action, but it is also a more general moral and political issue, which I think maybe you can close on uh, with a little brief comment. So there are several pieces of this. One is that what we've really seen, you know, I've, as a scientist, I've been explaining the science and that's what we've talked about until now. But the places that have been the most successful 
are the places that clearly in their statements and in their actions are acting from compassion, from a, a, an understanding of the value of human life and the need to protect people from disease and suffering and death. And I think that we have reached a point in the societies that we are part of where the society itself has a choice that I hope we will make in a better way, which is to understand that each individual is, it's, it is themselves a hugely important um, to, to, to everyone. And, you know, there is, a, there is this industrial era idea of people who have become like machines, right? Use machines, we became like machines. Um, and, and the value of our existence was measured by our economic output, a number. And I, I hope that the society will, will go beyond that and understand what we really know deep inside ourselves through our relationships with our family, members, our friends, um, that we will recognize that each of us is important and has unique contributions that we can make. And, you know, we can, we can talk about how do we build the mathematics of understanding people, because this is a mathematically oriented group. And we can talk about the nature of society and the structure of society. But I, I really think we have to uh, begin from a place of, of human understanding. And there are places, and I have to say, because we should ostracize the people in Sweden who have demonstrated lack of compassion and to, to find a way to bring them to justice. And I'm sure that there are many other places in the world that are deserving of justice uh, in the context of the demonstration of absence of compassion, in addition to confusion. But the way to get there is like the way of the, of the outbreak control. We have to start locally. We have to start by we have to start by appreciating each other. Thank you. Thank you, Yanir. Uh, Thank you, Yan. Thank you so much. I think this has been an inspiring, informative, and extremely uh, interesting talk. Uh, we are all very glad and honored to have you with us today. And I invite all our participants, and I'm sure this video is going to be shared widely further on on YouTube, so it has a larger audience. Uh, I invite everybody to visit your website and coronavirus.org and if you're interested if you're willing join the uh, join the uh, organizing the advocacy that Yanir and his uh, his people are doing uh, for for this tremendous uh, and terrific uh, outbreak that has pandemic that has struck us all so i think we can wrap it up here Yanir i really appreciate it and, and thank you so much for thank you passion and contribution really. Thank you. And Thank see you on Twitter. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. So to all the participants, I think uh, uh, at the conference and at this uh, in this keynote lecture, I just want to give you some last information. As you know, the parallel sessions are taking place at uh, 4.30, so we are making a little break after this keynote, keynote lecture. Uh, and uh, you will 
find all the information, rooms and different uh, uh, links on our website and following the, I think, uh, the recommendation, the invitation that Janir has given to us, all of us, I will again invite you really to contact him if you're willing and interested to join him in his uh, tremendous work. Thank you, everybody. And I don't know, Oswaldo, you want to say something uh, as a no, no. remark? Okay. It's okay. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you, everybody. And see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.